Welcome to the Yogic Studies Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Powell. This podcast features in-depth explorations into the traditions of yoga, Sanskrit, Indian philosophy, and South Asian religions. Through candid conversations with scholars and practitioners, we will immerse in the latest and most cutting-edge research on all things yoga. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Episode 7 of the Yogic Studies Podcast. In today's episode, we'll be speaking with Dr. Karen O'Brien Kopp from the University of Roehampton in London about her fascinating work on the intersections between Patanjali Yoga and Buddhist Yoga texts and traditions. Dr. Karen O'Brien Kopp is a lecturer in Asian religions and ethics in the Department of Philosophy, Theology, and Religious Studies at the University of Roehampton, London. She received her PhD from SOAS, University of London, and is a specialist in the historical study of meditation and yoga within Asian religious traditions and in the analysis of early Hindu and Buddhist meditation manuals in Sanskrit. Karen has published peer-reviewed articles in Religions of South Asia and the Journal of Indian Philosophy, and she is a co-editor of the forthcoming book, The Rutledge Handbook of Yoga and Meditation Studies, which will come out in fall of 2020. It's an interdisciplinary volume of 34 chapters from Global contributors, and which we talk about at the end of this podcast. She is currently working on a new book project on rethinking classical yoga in relation to Buddhism. As you'll hear in this episode, Karen will actually be teaching a new online course for us here at Yogic Studies on this very subject entitled YS109, Classical Yoga and Buddhism. It's a four-week online course which begins on July 13th, 2020. This course will offer a unique opportunity for comparative study to read the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali alongside lesser-known Buddhist texts on yoga and meditation from the same time period. For all course info and registration, you can visit yogicstudies.com forward slash YS 109. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Karen O'Brien Kopp. All right, I'm here with Karen O'Brien Kopp. Is that how you pronounce it? That is, thank you. Good. Uh, Karen, thank you so much for being here and joining the Yogic Studies podcast. Uh, I'm, I'm really uh, happy to have this conversation with you. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. How's your day going? Are you over in London right now? I am in London and it's the hottest day of the year so far. <laughs> so um, you may hear the jubilant um, musical uh, noises of children on the street in the late evening sunshine. Okay. Okay. Good to note. And uh did you, are you just finishing up a term of, of teaching right now? Are you at uh, the University of Roehampton? Is that right? I am indeed. I am a lecturer in Asian religions and ethics at the University of Roehampton. And I am, yes, finishing up marking for the spring term and looking ahead to planning for the autumn term. Yes. And before your autumn turn there, of course, you're going to be teaching a course for us here at Yogic Studies. Um, I am. And I'm very excited about that. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, I'm really excited and thrilled to have you offer this course on classical yoga and Buddhism. And I'm excited to talk with you about those subjects today on this podcast and about your, your research and your work investigating a really important and interesting topic, I think, for many on this confluence between early so-called classical yoga, and we'll talk about that, that term and phrase and why we might need to even rethink that a little bit, but the yoga of Patanjali, or Patanjali yoga, and its uh, counterpart and conversation partner and interlocutor with uh, Buddhism. Um, 
And um, before we get into uh, those texts and those subjects, though, I wonder if you might give us a little bit of background uh, about yourself and how you became an academic and somebody who studies yoga philosophy, Sanskrit, and Buddhism. I have been a practitioner of yoga for probably about 25 years. So it was through the practitioner path that I became uh, interested in academic study. I did an MA in traditions of yoga and meditation at SOAS University of London in the Department of Religions and Philosophies. And I studied Sanskrit there. Very fortunate to study with Jim Mallinson at SOAS, mm. um, who was also on my uh, supervisory committee for my PhD. So I stayed on at SOAS to do a PhD um, looking at uh, the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali and its connections to Buddhist uh, ideas and practices. Great. And yeah, your, your thesis at SOAS is entitled, I, lo I love the title of your thesis, Seed and Cloud as Metaphors of Liberation in Buddhist and Patanjali Yoga, an intertextual study. So tell us a little bit in brief about this dissertation, uh, about your work, and why studying the yoga of Patanjali, why it's so important to read Buddhist texts alongside Patanjali? When I began to read the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali within a wider corpus of religious and philosophical texts from the early common era, I was struck by the scholarship um, but also the textual resonances that I was seeing myself uh, between the Yoga Sutra and its commentary and the contemporaneous uh, religious texts and philosophical texts of Buddhism. Mm. So I became interested in the scholarship that already existed, um, but which seemed to me in part fragmentary uh, in investigating the claims that um, part of the discourse of the Yoga Sutra might be identified as quote unquote Buddhist, or perhaps sections of the text were in some way um, circulating in, in Buddhist uh, oral or, or written textual traditions. Um, or that there were certain terms that um, were perhaps being borrowed or in some kind of conceptual dialogue with uh, Buddhist systems of thought and liberation. So I became interested in the scholarship, which, to be honest, was already long standing. So mm -hmm. um, these observations had been made for a century of scholarship, um, you know, starting with. Um, Emile Senna in 1900, going through to Delaville Poussin in the 1930s, whereby scholars were noticing that there was a certain stream of technical language in the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, which uh, seemed to be um, more coherently identifiable as part of Buddhist discourse. So the scholarship was there. Um, it seemed to me that there were lots of finely tuned analyses looking at particular terms or um, perhaps particular sutras um, at being examined perhaps in chapters or articles and my attempt was to do something a little bit more systematic I'd hoped to take a synchronic slice of history you know if we if we approximately date the Patanjali Yoga Shastra or the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali and its commentary, if we approximately date that to um, late 4th, early 5th century, then what else was in circulation at the time? Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed to be necessary to read the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali intertextually uh, in its own textual, conceptual, intellectual 
um, practice based milieu to see what other ideas it might have been interacting with, what other texts it might, may have been referring to. Uh, so that was the, the broad projection and scope mm -hmm. of the dissertation at the outset. Uh, and I was able to, to begin with some very solid scholarship by people like Philip Maas, who I saw give a paper um, in 2013 at uh, the University of Vienna on um, the way in which Patanjali appeared to be responding to a, um, a particular uh, set of sutras uh, or a set of um, verses in Buddhist uh, Abhidharma literature, Sarvastivada Abhidharma, mm. which is a particular school. Um, so I began to look at um, a particular Buddhist text, which was the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya, we can talk about that, mm -hmm. of Vasubandhu. And the more I looked, the more I found in terms of other Buddhist texts. So actually, I feel that my dissertation, although I wanted to do something more systematic, in a sense, um, feels like I just opened the door into, um, you know, a whole project where there's still a great deal of, of scholarship to be done. Mm -hmm. Because it's an intertextual endeavour, um, as I said, the more you look, the more you find that's interesting and needs to be investigated further from text to text. Right. So you, you note that there, there is a long-standing history of scholars raising these questions and issues, pointing to shared terminology between yoga and Buddhist texts going back, you know, at least 100 years. Um, but it also, in my experience, has been the case that while you have very in-depth studies on the Buddhist side, sort of on the, you know, the, the Buddhologists, uh, say Yogacara or Abhidharma texts, um, and then as yoga studies has really continued to grow, especially in recent decades, um, kind of on the side of yoga history and yoga philosophy, the philology and study of yoga's texts, sometimes those fields can sort of seem far apart or not always in conversation, uh, especially at conferences like the American Academy of Religion, where you have the, you know, the yoga chata specialists and, you know, an entire working group dedicated to that but there often is not much dialogue and exchange between the Yogacara Buddhist scholars and the yoga studies scholars. So I think what you're doing in some ways is helping to bridge that gap and is really important in bringing these two um, fields of scholarship together to read across these texts, which as your work shows, really does need to be read together because it seems, and we'll talk about this more with some examples, how the authors of these texts themselves seem to have been in conversation. Uh, do you have any thoughts about that? Or, you know, how, do, do you agree with that assessment that at oftentimes, and I'm sure there's many exceptions to this, but oftentimes that there's kind of the Buddhist scholars over here and the yoga scholars over here and not always in conversation? I do agree. Um, and I think there are, of course, um, also important exceptions. So if you look at the work of uh, Gerald Larson, for example, who um, was a foremost scholar um, of classical Sankhya, um, he very much uh, investigated the Buddhist texts and the Buddhist traditions. Um, and I think when we look at the work of some South Asian scholars like Pradeep Gokhale, they have uh, for many years been making this argument mm. that, um, you know, the Patanjali Yoga Shastra is interwoven with certain Buddhist texts and traditions. But I think on the whole, you make a really important point, which is that we do have this, um, categorical separation that is very much bound up with the, um, in a sense, the scholarly evolution of the category of religion itself in the 19th century and the whole 
development of the world religions paradigm mm. um, and the way in which Hinduism gets um, distinguished from, you know, a, a, another discrete entity, categorical entity called Buddhism, distinguished from another discrete entity called Jainism in the history of early South Asia. So in some senses, this is a Eurocentric categorical lens that mm. I would say is bound up with the project of um, empire with the colonialist project. It's part of the, um, you know, the 19th century administrative um, enterprise of categorizing and sorting South Asian culture so that it can be better, uh, quote unquote, managed <clears throat> as a resource. So I think um, epistemically, our present day universities um, are still working within that framework to a certain degree. Um, and that means when you quite often, um, when you go to study, uh, <clears throat> for example, South Asian religions, you will end up being a specialist in either Hindu studies or Buddhist studies, but not necessarily both, mm -hmm. or perhaps Jain studies or perhaps South Asian Islam. So on the one hand, we have that history of uh, the way religions have been uh, categorized and studied in academia. But on the other hand, there are also very good reasons why scholars tend to specialize in either Buddhism or, for example, Hinduism, which have to do um, quite often with uh, the amount of time and skill that is invested in language expertise. Mm. So um, I have invested my time in Prakrit and um, Sanskrit, uh, which have also given me access to particular texts in the Indian Buddhist tradition. However, <laughs> you get mm -hmm. to a certain point with Buddhist studies and mm -hmm. you realize, oh, actually, Mm -hmm. um, to access these texts, which are extant only in Chinese or Tibetan, I really need to have Chinese and Tibetan. Right. So I think there are, um, you know, different language skill sets that scholars tend to acquire at the outset if they're going to um, go into Buddhist studies. And quite often, um, because of the way, um, the ways in which uh, Buddhism uh, transmitted very quickly regionally across Asia, um, you do need to have more than Sanskrit. You need to have ch Chinese and or Tibetan as well. Yeah. And possibly and becomes, some Central Asian languages. So I think, and, you know. It becomes a huge undertaking that then takes the, the graduate student in all kinds of directions. Right. And it might be a decision that you need to make fairly early on in your career, perhaps in terms of that language acquisition and which languages you get in your toolbox early, early on. Um, and which scripts as well. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think in some senses it's, you know, that's one very um, understandable reason why we do have these streams of scholarship. Um, mm -hmm. Partly the ways in which um, academia operates, and I think partly it's just very practically uh, the way that particular... Um, disciplinary scholarly paths develop quite early on in a career. And yet, if we are to understand a text like the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, as your work so clearly uh, demonstrates, we really are to think uh, not just inter intertextually, but across the boundaries of these so-called traditions, because that's how the authors themselves thought. Right. Right. Um, and I think, again, we have to be careful of imposing our um, present day understandings of religious identity um, anachronistically back onto pre-modern pre -modern India, mm. onto his, you know, let's say classical South Asia. Um, and partly this is... Uh, you know, a consequence of Indian um, doxography or um, scholastic ways of arranging schools and, and ranking them. You mm -hmm. know, we have these um, very clear 
um, systems of uh, thought, such as the um, Astika and Nastika, um, those who adhere to the Vedas and those who don't. Right. Um, but even which, that, which, is yeah, something that develops quite a bit later within Indian intellectual history, right? Right. Um, but nonetheless, it's one of the lenses through which we filter our present day understanding of, of those intellectual communities, those practicing communities. Um, but I think on the ground in the early centuries of the common era, um, those identities may indeed have been much more fluid, um, perhaps much more transient. Um, it may be that, for example, um, a philosopher who specialized in logic um, saw themselves first and foremost as a logician rather than a Buddhist logician or a Jain logician or mm. um, uh, uh, and, you know, somebody who adheres to the Nyaya school. So I think we do have to be careful, yes, of, of imposing or reading back these very strict demarcations of identity. Mm, yeah, that's really interesting. So speaking of categories, um, you know, today we often throw around, I think rather loosely, this, this phrase of classical yoga, which is ascribed uh, pretty singularly to the Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, perhaps with the, the Bhashya, the earliest commentarial layer, and perhaps together then as the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, as Philip Moss has argued. But nonetheless, this, this notion of classical yoga ascribed to the yoga of Patanjali. And I think there's a whole history um, you know, of, of why that has come to be and why Patanjali has been singled out um, and perhaps the status of that text, you know, as we know, has now been elevated to new heights as modern postural yoga has kind of taken the reins and elevated that text as sort of the scriptural foundation for postural yoga. Uh, when we know very well some of the historical complications with that and in many ways, how, how little the yoga of today is reflected in this early common era Brahminical text. Now, one of the things I, I, I really appreciate that, that you've done in your work, and I, I heard you give a conference paper on, I think, was this at the World Sanskrit Conference in Vancouver? I think is where I first heard you present this. You, you, you probably presented it earlier or elsewhere. Um, but this notion of um, challenging the, the status of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra as the exemplar of quote-unquote classical yoga. So I want to read this quote from you uh, from your 2017 article. Um, you talk about how our notion of classical yoga has sort of been eclipsed by the well-known definition from Yoga Sutra 1.2, yoga chitta vritti narodaha. Yoga is the cessation of mental fluctuations. This famous definition, right, that, that I'm sure all of our listeners are aware of and that has come to represent quote unquote classical yoga. So you write, quote, yet it is time to challenge the privileged status of the Patanjali Yoga Shastra as the textual arbiter of classical yoga. Why has classical yoga not been associated with the Buddhist Yogacara Bhumi Shastra, a vast compendium on yoga practice with a final redaction in the fourth or fifth century? This omission seems remarkable given that we have more textual content for Buddhist yoga than Patanjali yoga in this period." End quote. So I really appreciate you just, you make that really clear you lay this out, we need to rethink this category and we need to perhaps include texts and forms of Buddhist yoga um, in, in, if we're going to maintain this category of classical yoga. So can you unpack that a little bit for us and tell us a little bit more of uh, you know, your thoughts behind this? Yes, um, so there's quite a lot in there. <laughs> to unpack. Um, I think the first point to make is that when I'm talking about the category of classical yoga, in 
on the whole, I'm referring to um, an Anglophone, uh, modern, um, post-Enlightenment term, classical, which is at a certain point coupled with the term yoga to create this Anglophone category that is in circulation um, by scholars in, for example, religious studies, South Asian studies, philosophy. Mm. Um, so I'm not for a moment suggesting that the Astika category and the, you know, the, the very traditional um, association of the Yoga Sutra as the root text of the Yoga Darshana. So I'm not suggesting for a moment that, that we should um, in some way uh, critique that as not accurate. I'm actually more interested in the later scholarly, um, in many ways, Eurocentric lenses, which pick up on, as I said, those medieval Indian dox doxographies and those ways of um, mm. classifying yoga. If I can just pause so, for a moment, just to clarify yeah. a really important point, what you just mm. said. So you're saying that it is true that within the Indian Sanskrit traditions, these texts, these doxographies, which classify and even create hierarchies of these different darshanas, these different philosophical systems, they associate, they call the yoga darshana, that is the tr philosophical tradition based on the yoga sutra and its commentaries. So they, in that, in that way, have a quote unquote, you know, identification of Patanjali as the yoga tradition. But that's different yeah. than this phrase, this English phrase, classical yoga. It is. Um, and that's one of the problems that I'm grappling with in my uh, book project, in my manuscript currently, is, um, and I'm not quite going to get into this at the moment, but, you know, is the, is the category of classical yoga appropriate is it anachronistic? Is it Eurocentric? And what other, um, for example, Sanskrit or South Asian language oriented terms might we employ more fruitfully for historical accuracy? Um, yeah, because so a lot, a lot I, gets yeah. eclipsed, right, when we, when we do that. Right. Um, I mean, if we want to talk about the term classical, it is a Eurocentric term that either refers to um, historical periodization or to particular um, aesthetic cultural values from um, the Greco-Roman philosophical traditions. So we have those kinds of problems, which is a, about categorical misfit of um, imposing these terms uh, historically onto a different um, cultural and historical tradition. Um, but I suppose in, in some senses, what I'm interested in is um, going beyond, in a sense, the Indian doxographies, going beyond the later um, Orientalist framings, um, both of which have their own agendas, uh, because we have to bear in mind that by the time of the um, the, uh, the flowering of the doxographical traditions in India, Buddhism has very much diminished as a, um, a kind of significant majoritarian philosophical or religious tradition in South Asia. And it's, it's moved on, it's, it's mm. moved on into China, it's moving across um, the Asian continent very quickly. Um, so I think that um, also determines how, um, yoga is um, related or not related to Buddhism in the medieval period um, yeah. in South Asia by um, Indian scholars. But I think if we excavate even further beyond these scholastic framings, um, what I was interested in doing in a sense was trying to go back to what I might call on the ground discourse um, and perhaps practice in the early centuries of the common era um, to see if we read the Yoga Sutra intertextually, if we read around it, can we find out more about who was practicing yoga or um, who was practicing traditions or, um, that seem to be very related, perhaps in some cases identical, but which aren't called yoga? Mm. Um, 
can we get a richer, fuller picture of these yoga oriented aesthetic practices um, in and around the Yoga Sutra at the time of the fourth century or the early fifth century? Um, so that was my starting point and my motivation for um, an investigation of discourse, because I think it's very difficult to um, ascertain uh, concrete details about practice in the early common era. We have so little material evidence available to us, but we can look at the discourse, which is evident in the texts and which is linked to um, the lived uh, intellectual traditions and discourses of the times in which they were produced and which can tell us something about practice. Right. Yeah, I'm just I'm just recalling, you know, sometimes uh, I can't remember which scholar has made this argument, but you've heard things like that Patanjali is a quasi Buddhist or is a perhaps a Buddhist convert to the Brahminical tradition um, because of some of the language that he uses in the text um, or even um, you know, I think more recently, I, I, I believe Philip Moss has put forth this idea that the Patanjali Yoga Shastra in, in some ways is a Brahminical response to the, really the, the flourishing and championing of yoga and meditation within Buddhist traditions at the same time. Right. Um, and I think that's a key word here, response, or I quite often use the word dialogue. Um, because I think it's important to recall that these sutras and shastras are distillations of the living cultures of debate um, that were taking place in the early centuries of the common era. And um, that these debates brought together thinkers from different schools and traditions, um, different communities, uh, to actively, you know, refute each other's ideas. So it was very clear that in order to engage in debate, if you were, for example, in the Sankhya camp, and if you were debating against um, a philosopher from Nyaya or Vaisheshika or, or Vedanta, you had to know their positions inside out mm. in order to refute them. So I think this comes back to the um, problem of narrowing definitions of identity to just Sankhya or just yoga or just um, Yogachara or, you know, Savastivada, Vaibhashika in the Buddhist uh, streams, because actually um, these philosophers were potentially very conversant and familiar with much more than one tradition and potentially expert in much more than one, even if it's to be able to refute that tradition. And I think in that process of debate and dialogue, there's constant um, absorption of ideas, um, reworking of ideas as part of the skill of refutation. And this is where these um, processes of co-opting, transforming ideas, um, you know, in order to be able to um, win debates in order to be able to perform rhetorically in a debate situation. So I, for me, I think I was interested in trying to find out more about this um, culture and community of, of lived d debates from which the texts are then, um, a text like the Yoga Sutra is potentially a kind of distillation. Yeah, and so if we are to sort of, um, you know, put our scholar hats on and maybe even our Indiana Jones hat and we are to try to travel back in time and to get on the ground during this really rich, you know, early fourth, fifth century in the common era, the sort of end of the Gupta period um, within, uh, within the first millennium of India, when there really was this rich flourishing of scholastic and philosophical traditions, as well as poetics and the arts and logic. And as we try to expand our, our vision of yoga beyond and alongside Patanjali and what we might call the Brahminical yoga tradition, 
as you write, we have actually more textual content for a Buddhist yoga during this period than Patanjali yoga. So what was going on on the, on the Buddhist side during this period? And what were some of the texts that you found and that you continue to find are really important and significant to read alongside Patanjali? As I mentioned, I began by looking at the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya. Uh, so Kosha means treasury. So this text is the treasury of Abhidharma, which is one of the mainstream <coughs> Buddhist schools that is generally characterized as scholastic and developed very complex ways of classifying being and reality. I was looking at this text by Vasubandhu, which is it, in itself a voluminous treatise. It's uh, <clears throat> the verses which summarize the orthodox um, Sarvastivada Abhidharma tradition and an auto commentary, meaning that the author Vasubandhu wrote the verses and then wrote the commentary, which discusses and expands on those verses. And by looking at this text, I realized um, that it has an intertextual relationship with another text, another um, great treatise called the Yogachara Bhumi Shastra. Mm. So this is the Shastra or the treatise um, which contains the, the Bhumis or the foundations of Yogachara. Mm. Uh, and mm. at this point I how became interested. How do we interested. understand that interesting? Right. Um, so, <clears throat> Within the last couple of decades, I think the discussion on what Yogachara means was in some ways very much determined by um, some influential um, articles by Jonathan Silk, where he argues that um, it's such a, you know, widely used and varying term that we can't really pin it down to a specific meaning, but that we should regard it as having a quite generic meaning, such as spiritual practitioner within Buddhism. But in recent um, years, we've had some variant um, studies coming out, people like Daniel Stewart um, or Florent Delanue, who have looked at the um, term um, more technically within specific texts of the early Yogacara tradition. And we start to see this argument developing that actually it is possible and desirable to uh, to think about yogachara as meaning something like yoga discipline, which is how I translate it, or mm -hmm. yoga practice. Um, and, and so I became interested in the Yogachara Bhumi Shastra as a Shastra on the discipline of yoga within Buddhism. Um, now, I think there's a couple of points to make here about the um, the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra, uh, which is that um, it's one of those texts that hasn't been incredibly well preserved in Sanskrit. So again, um, there has been more scholarship in um, on the Tibetan and um, Chinese uh, editions of this text. Mm. Um, it's a very uh, it's a very long text, which is actually not really a singular composition, but comprise, com it, it's comprising um, a whole range of books that are um, brought together into one unitary composition over a long period of time, possibly centuries. So the earliest uh, layers, which would be um, a book that's called the Shravaka Bhumi and another book that's called the Bodhisattva Bhumi, um, date back probably to the second, third um, centuries of the common era in their proto forms or their you know their very early forms um so they... it's not it's not an easy um you know you can't just pick it up and find it in english translation even the the work of translating it into english and creating critical editions is still very much in process mm. um are the earliest manuscripts that we have <clears throat> of those those boomies are they in chinese they are yeah, yeah. Um, they are preserved in Chinese, the very earliest proto 
layers and then they show up again um, in Sanskrit uh, a couple of centuries later in the, you know, the final redaction of the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra. Mm, so it's a complex, kind. it's a complex text. And I think this goes back to your question of why, in a sense, why haven't we been looking at Yogacara? Um, well, perhaps in terms of translations and critical editions um, and the ways in which scholars train, typically who are in yoga studies, perhaps this is the moment when we start to, to have the text um, available to us in a more accessible way. Right. Yeah. Very, very complicated textual history and transmission written in Sanskrit and then transmitted probably across the Silk route to China, to Chinese, and then back to Sanskrit, and then probably eventually into Tibetan. Is that right? That is right. Yes. Um, uh, so when it's transmitted into China, I'm not sure that it necess necessarily comes back into Sanskrit, but I suppose it shows up in Sanskrit so that it may have been extant, influential, circulating uh, the Shravaka Bhumi, for example, um, in South Asia, but it just hasn't survived. So that whole very early part of the Yoga Charabhumi Shastra is like many um, of the key Indian philosophical texts, somewhat, um, still somewhat unaccessible to us. Mm. Um, so when I started looking at Yoga Chara, the other key question that I was interested in was an emerging strand of scholarship in Buddhist studies, which was positioning um, a slightly different Yogacara community to the one that might be better known in the main in Buddhist studies. So in Buddhist studies, Yogacara um, is obviously one of the, the mainstreams of Mahayana Buddhism, um, along with the Madhyamaka tradition and the Pragnaparamita traditions. Um, but Yogacara is typically seen as a school of philosophy um, that in some sense crystallizes around the fifth century. Um, and again, scholars like um, Florent Delanu and Daniel Stewart were interested in an earlier uh, community of Yogacara, Yogacharas who were in some sense not these uh, philosophers, but early ascetic practitioners of meditation mm. um, and retreat, and who had somewhat of a special status within uh, Buddhist monastic communities. So I became interested in the fact that we have these early, um, in some senses, they're referred to as forest ascetics, who are engaged in the discipline of yoga within Buddhism, um, who in some senses are connected back to um, Vasubandhu's text through a dis dissident community called the Sautrantikas. So with, without wishing to go into too much technical detail, because I know mm. we don't have all of these Sanskrit terms displayed in front of us to look at, mm. um, but it became clear that there's a very complex web of communities um, that are sharing ideas in the first, second, third century of the common era um, and who are, in some senses, claiming this title of yoga through this term, yogachara, discipline of yoga. Mm. Now, you know, in Patanjali, we get this definition of yoga, as we, as we spoke about 1.2, you know, yoga is the citta vritti nirodha, uh, the cessation of the turnings of the mind. And in the Bhashya, in the commentary, we, we learn that this is equated with a, a state of samadhi. Do, you do we have any, any, any clear definitions of yoga like that in uh, these Yogacara texts? We have, as we discussed, this term Yogacara, which, as you said, can kind of loosely mean spiritual practice or, or the practice of yoga. But what, what is yoga uh, in the Yogacara context? And, and what can we say about how this relates or or differentiates from the yoga of Patanjali? That's a really interesting question because um, across the Yoga Chara Bhumi Shastra and also in other early Mahayana sutras, 
we, we do find uh, varying definitions of yoga and yogachara. So for example, if we go back to the Shravaka Bhumi, uh, which is one of the early layers of the Yogachara Bhumi Shastra, yeah. we come across a definition of yoga as consisting of four elements, which are faith, shraddha, aspiration, chandas, vigor, um, or courage, virya, and fourthly, means, upaya. Mm. So my question was, what are the processes of, um, first and foremost, canonization? Um, why is it that the Yogacara Bhumi Shastra, which deals with the discipline of yoga, isn't part of, of the so-called classical canon? Um, it is a shastra on yoga or yogachara. And how is it that certain definitions become, as you say, elevated or prioritized um, or in a sense canonized um, so that uh, Patanjali's definition is quintessential, but the, the de this fourfold definition, yoga is faith, aspiration, courage, and means, that this is probably fairly unknown to the majority of um, yoga studies scholars who are working within the Brahminical uh, domain, the, working with the Brahminical texts. Um, and there are many other examples of way, different ways in which yoga um, is explained or um, systematized within the Buddhist Yogacara texts within mm. the early Mahayana tradition. So I became very interested in this. Um, first of all, as we say, what is on the ground? Um, and what happens if we ask those very um, rebellious questions? Um, because I think that's an important part of scholarship is to, when you're starting out on a new research project to investigate what are my assumptions, if I assume that yoga is exclusively part of the Brahmanical tradition, um, well, what happens if I ask the question, but what if it was the Buddhists who were the predominant practitioners and ideologists and, um, you know, intellectual um, debaters of the yoga tradition in the early common era? Mm, yeah. What if hist history has in some way filtered out uh, the fact that that Buddhist discourse, uh, which is there in the text, is perhaps pointing to uh, a more substantial or more significant um, living tradition, practice tradition that we perhaps have yet to really understand. And this, this definition of these four elements, faith, aspiration, vigor, and means, that's a really interesting definition of yoga. And in, in, in it, it reads as, as a list of cultivation practices or even qualities. Um, rather than yoga as a state or a goal, this, this usage of yoga really does seem to refer to a set of ethical and, and meditative practices. Would you, would you agree with that? Uh, very much so. Um, so in a sense, uh, there isn't really a distinction here between um, what we would now call meditation and yoga. Mm. Um, or indeed between um, ethical practice or, or an ethical identity and meditation, because they're very much bound up with each other. They're very much one and the same. To, to meditate is to be ethical, is to be practicing uh, the discipline of yoga. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, certainly within the Buddhist tradition, I should frame that as within um within the the early you know buddhist tradition of, of the early common era so i want to get into some some examples a little bit from the yoga sutra and then from this buddhist literature that you've highlighted in your work that i think really illuminates how reading across these these texts and traditions can really help us to understand um a text like the Yoga Sutra perhaps more fully and to understand how perhaps its author Patanjali may have been thinking and 
you know, how he might have been using very technical terminology. And in certain cases, I think, as, as you and others show, maybe, uh, you know, reformulating or readapting key, key terms. So you have this uh, wonderful article uh, from 2017 published in the Religions of South Asia. The, the article is titled uh, Classical Discourses of Liberation, Shared Botanical Metaphors in Sarvastivada Buddhism and the Yoga of Patanjali. And I love this idea, I have to say, of shared botanical metaphors, because even before I, I, I've seen your work and heard you present on this, it's actually something that occurred to me, um, I actually can't take full credit for it, it was, it was during a, a seminar, a grad seminar at Harvard, which I was the teaching assistant for uh, with Francis, Professor Francis Clooney. And we were just doing a, a close reading of the Yoga Sutra and um, its, its bhashya and commentary. And one thing that became really, really clear just on the yoga side, on the Patanjali side, is that there's a lot of imagery and metaphor um, of what, we, what we, we kind of refer to as agricultural terms, um, referring to, as, as you point out as well, seeds and, and the burning of seeds. Um, there's even the mind or chitta, there's this image of the mind as, as, as like a river and all of the currents, the chitta vrittis flowing that need to be dammed. And it's, it was really quite interesting just to sort of detect that in the text. And then in this article, I think what you do so well is to show that in some ways Patanjali is, is leaning on or, or drawing on a wider discursive network of, of using some of these botanical metaphors. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, and maybe in particular, we can look at this idea of the kleshas and this model of, of the kleshas or the mental afflictions um, using uh, metaphors of, of um, botany. Right. Um, lots of <laughs> interesting ideas in there to respond to. Um, in terms of the, the shared botanical metaphors, I mean, we find these in the Yoga Sutra, in Buddhist texts, also in Jain texts, and arguably into all genres of literature and cultural output. Um, and I think in some sense, this is inevitable if we think about the way that um, concepts are formed. Um, and I'm, I'm drawing here a little bit on um, conceptual metaphor theory, but concepts in a, in, a, in a way have to draw on the experiential knowledge that we have of the world. Um, and conceptual metaphor theory would say that every concept is in some way um, drawing on our experience of the world and our embodied experience of the world. So all of these systems of liberation that we see in, 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 Brahman, in uh, the Brahmanical tradition, in, in Buddhism, um, you know, systems of uh, becoming liberated, um, complex um, pathways of practice, uh, I think that they're all constructed from the material world that these thinkers and practitioners and philosophers dwelt in. Mm. Um, and so that in that sense, um, we're talking about a largely um, agricultural world, um, mm. uh, an experience of the world that's very much informed by um, existential uh, needs, um, food production, um, weather patterns, for example, these would have been very prevalent in the experience and worldview of um, our actors in the second, third century. So in, in some sense, I think that real world experience is showing up in the texts, all of the texts and all of the cultural artifacts from poetry to plays, etc. Karen, are you um, saying that Patanjali might have also been a gardener or a farmer? <laughs> Not necessarily, but I think that the... Um, the existential reality of um, adulthood and um, survival in the early common era is, you know, it would have been much more acutely tuned into um, the natural world and food cycles and weather patterns, much more than it is for us now mm -hmm. <laughs> in our contemporary world. 
Um, so I think that these systems of liberation are in some sense, um, as I point out, drawing on you know, botanical cycles of the seed and the plant growth and the fruition and how to weed out the bad plants and, um, you know, the kind of necessity of, of rain as a great boon, but also, um, you know, existentially necessary. I think that all of these material conditions um, of survival, in a way, inform the, the way that theories of liberation develop and therefore inform the way that paths of practice and meditation and um, bodily practices, the way that they're constructed um, systematically. Um, so I suppose to sum up that point, um, I think, you know, seeing all of these botanical metaphors show up in the text is part and parcel of the lived reality of of that time. Um, but then your other point about certain um, particular metaphors showing up in very technical ways, I think is interesting. And this is the point that I've tried to lay out in that 2017 article. Um, I became interested in the glaciers, uh, which interestingly, if, you're, if you are in Hindu studies, studies or yoga studies, you probably refer to the glaciers, you translate them as the afflictions. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're working in Buddhist studies, more often they will be the defilements. Mm. Um, the glaciers are the defilements. Um, so this is just a convention, a translational convention. In and the what is what is what is signif significant about that difference, even in in the English terms, but within the, those different contexts, affliction versus defilement. Well, I mean, you could argue if we're looking at the um, metaphorical significance of each you could argue that um, affliction um, in some way is drawing on the domain of uh, medical discourse the idea that there's a pain or an illness that can be in some sense remedied or countered mm -hmm. with a medicine whereas defilement is part of a different um, conceptual domain which perhaps i don't know perhaps is more um, attuned to um, ritual practice or uh, other social um, practices, which is to do with purity and impurity. Mm. Uh, or perhaps, who knows, al alchemy, you know, to do with purity and impurity of particular um, substances that are being transformed. Mm. Um, Your point so, is really, is really mm. good, good, though, and notable in that, you know, not only do we have variability in how some of these technical Sanskrit terms are translated, but if you're trained within a particular discipline and if you kind of work on Hindu studies and more on the Brahminical text, you might just naturally translate a term in, in a particular way based on the history of scholarship on that subject, which, which then if you're working in kind of a different disciplinary camp, uh, say on, the, on Buddhist studies, th th there might be a different sentiment to, to the same term, whether or not it's actually the same, whether or not the, the, the meaning of the Sanskrit term is the same or not, but it's just interesting to reflect on our definitions, our translations of these Sanskrit terms and how those often are shaped by our Sanskrit English dictionaries, by the history of scholarship on that subject. And I think one thing that you do actually really well in this article is you complicate some of those terms a little bit um, and, and again show how when reading across the Brahminical and the Buddhist textual lines we can perhaps get a fuller picture of, of, of some of these terms and I think that's that's really important I but sorry I think I cut you off though when no you, you didn't <laughs> get into the into the Klesha, um, model here that, that you that you're working on here in this article um, right. So to, I mean, I, I don't think you cut me off at all, but um, to continue that thread, um, I did become very interested in this term, klesha, because I hadn't, in my readings of um, the relevant um, 
Brahmanical literature such as the Gita, the Upanishads, um, the Shanti Parvan and the Mahabharata, I hadn't been particularly struck by um, elaborate discussions of the kleshas, the afflictions. Um, so I was interested in looking into this more. Um, of course, the kleshas are um, mentioned um, in the Brahmanical sources, but not to the extent that they are systematically um, elaborated in the Buddhist sources. So the um, in some texts you will uh, see that um, in some ways the very goal of Buddhist practice is the is the eradication of the kleshas and mm. eradicating the kleshas is in some um, technical definitions equated with the state of liberation itself. Mm -hmm. um, and there are very, um, as I mentioned, systematic, detailed analyses of what the glaciers are, um, what different types of technical practices you do to remove particular glaciers, what, what the process is of removing these glaciers, how specific glaciers um, can be treated in meditation. Um, so there's a very um, extensive discourse on glaciers in these um, meditation manuals that we find not only in Yogacara but also in the scholastic Abhidharma tradition. Um, and then I was able to in many ways build on the work of preceding scholars all the way from um, you know the 19th century um, Indian and Orientalist scholars all the way up to Philip Mars's work in 2013 mm -hmm. and to find some new instances of intertextual mirroring. I don't want to call it borrowing, but in a sense, mirroring between Vasubandhu's text, which is the Apidama Koshabhashya, and Patanjali's text. And so that 2017 article discusses, I think, two or three different passages, one of which is um, a very close, almost word for word, um, technical reuse. Um, between Vasubandhu's and Patanjali's texts, and the others are um, slightly more loose into textual um, passages in terms of the relationship. But it was interesting because, um, you know, depending on how we date the Patanjali Yoga Shastra and the Vasubandhu, uh, Vasubandhu's text, um, it, it might be possible um, to assert that Patanjali is borrowing, in some sense, from the discourse that we see in the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya. Um, but the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya itself, uh, in some sense, represents two different um, debates or discursive positions within, within the text. Um, so the verses present the orthodox um, Savastivada Abhidharma view. And then in the commentary, um, we have um, a dissident group called the Sautrantikas. They're, there's not a lot known about them, um, but they're very interesting and they do, um, uh, they do sort of um, hold this dis dissident position where they reject uh, a lot of the orthodox um, truths or, um, or uh, positions in Abhidharma. So what I was trying to trace in the article was the fact that when Patanjali is, seems to be referring to the ideas in Vasubandhu's text, he's not referring to the orthodox positions, um, but what he seems to be reproducing, if we can say that mm -hmm. um, in terms of the theory of the glaciers um, and how they um, evolve, how they get destroyed, um, he seems to be referring to this dissident position held by the group called the Sautrantikas. Mm -hmm. And they develop quite a, um, a distinct theory of um, how you get rid of the afflictions in the mind. Um, there are particular techniques um, which are described uh, using metaphors um, that are drawing on the botanical realm, drawing on agriculture, so you have to take the seed and you have to burn it, which um, destroys its germination potential, meaning that it can't self-seed in the substratum of the mind um, and so forth. There are these very um, specific uh, technical terms that are used in the Yoga Sutra that we 
typically only find in the South Trantica positions in the um, Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya. Yeah, there's this constant metaphor, th this phrase, I think mostly in the Bhashya of the, the Yoga Sutra, the, the Dagda Bija, the burnt mm. seed. And so would you suggest this is not original to the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, this notion of the klesha as uh, likened to a seed, this, this affliction or defilement um, of the mind, like ignorance, um, you know, depending on how we translate these, um, uh, attraction, aversion, and so forth, these, these kleshas that need to somehow be scorched or burnt like a seed. Is that something that is shared uh, with this um, Abhidharma uh, literature? Um, it is shared actually um, more broadly as a metaphor, mm. but the precise wording that we see in the Yoga Sutra in terms of the passage in the, in the commentary, um, that very close intertextual correspondence is with, in particular, this passage in the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya. I mean, for both traditions, mm. it's really like the key thing that has to be removed for liberation to occur. For Patanjali, you know, he says that in 2.1, you know, this Kriya Yoga and 2.2, Kriya Yoga is for the cultivation of Samadhi and for the weakening of the kleshas. And then when we get to Ashtanga yoga a little bit later, he doesn't use the word klesha, but rather ashuddhi, I believe, um, impurities. But Ashtanga yoga is for the removal of impurities. Um, so there, for Patanjali, it's, it's quite clear that like the purpose of a yoga practice, on the one hand, is for the purification or removal of these sort of mental obstacles or afflictions, things that keep one from perceiving reality clearly, we might even say, for, for a Sankhya Yoga perspective, the one that keeps one bound uh, to Prakriti. Um, and so the kleshas are, are really, really important within this model of liberation and the the practice of yoga it seems for patanjali in many ways we could say is actually to to purify and remove the kleshas is that similar for vasubandhu it is very much um the same theory that we find in vasubandhu and that we find um discussed by this dissident group called the Sautrantikas, because they are really concerned with the fact that the glaciers are so dangerous um, because they have this um, state, which is dormancy, that they are um, lying um, undetected in the substratum of the mind in this dormant state, um, and that um, they're therefore um, difficult to remove because of that um, state in which they have potential, but they're not yet um, actuated. They're not yet being, um, you know, awakened and expressed. Mm -hmm. And that sounds very, very similar to the, the Patanjala model, and this notion of the, the depository, right, or ashaya, that like the samskaras and vasanas, these remainders or traces, you know, these difficult words to, to translate, but that, that there's this potentiated state, to use the metaphor of, of, of a seed, um, like you could, you could um, eliminate some of the seeds. You could even burn it, right? But maybe not burn it completely and that there's still the potential for that seed to germinate if the causes and conditions come together for that seed to germinate. So there's levels of the mm -hmm. extermination, right, of the, of mm -hmm. the seed of Klesha. Exactly. Um, 
and I see, you know, we, we see this mirroring between um, the commentary to Yoga Sutra 2.4, which is asking these questions um, about the different modes of existence or the different states in which a klesha can exist, um, and which is asking the question, what is the dormant state? Mm. Um, and what is it that causes um, a dormant klesha to awake? And this is very resonant of a passage in the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya um, 5.1, um, which asks the same questions in the same order um, about dormancy and awakening. And I think um, it's this kind of, um, if you like, anxiety about the klesha, which is exactly showing up in those um, metaphorical descriptions of um, not just burning the seed, but scorching it to... Um, the degree that the germination potential will not again be reactivated or will not again re reawaken. Um, so it's this very technical, um, botanically derived understanding of how the mind operates and how habits, negative habits are um, created and perpetuated in the mind. Um, which are the focus of meditation practice. That is what the meditation practice is designed to um, eliminate. Yeah, and, and you make this important point in the 2017 article that there, there are some scholars, I believe Endo previously, who have looked at this klesha and this burning of the, of the klesha model from a tapas standpoint, from kind of the broader Brahminical uh, notions of an ascetic cultivating this inner heat that can burn through and purify the, the um, impurities or, or afflictions like kleshas. And while that might make sense to some degree and within like a Kriya yoga context of uh, tapas being one of those three ingredients of Kriya yoga to eliminate the kleshas, it perhaps doesn't capture the full picture uh, because, as you said, there's these imprints and these attenuated um, and, and dormant states that still need to be addressed. And that I, it seems like the, the Buddhist context helps us to, to fill out more clearly when we look not only at this from a, a, from a tapas angle, but from a broader soteriology of removing the impediments of ignorance of avidya to use patanjali's term um, that it's not simply uh the purification say of, of of karmic activity but there's actually something more nociological or or uh, some some sort of shift that seems to then take place uh, eliminating an incorrect perception. There's some sort of positive pole of this, right? Where there's actually a wisdom or a jnana that arises through this process. Um, I'm kind of generalizing a bit now, but, but do you think, is that something that is important on the Buddhist side that it's not simply the elimination or burning of the negative obstacles but there's also the cultivation and there's the, the growth of a, a type of liberating knowledge or wisdom. Absolutely. Um, and depending on which school and which tradition uh, we're looking at, um, the, clash, you know, the, the, the elimination of the clashes um, may then be uh, followed by um, different, more advanced um, states. Um, and or practices uh, to lead to full liberation. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that in um, the Buddhist meditative tradition, um, the elimination of the kleshas is a quintessential feature of all of those um, different meditation models. Yeah, and so speaking about kind of liberating states and uh, reading across these these traditions. Uh, you have a, a recent article um, published in 2020 by the Journal of Indian Philosophy 
entitled Dharma Mega in Yoga and Yogachara, the revision of a superlative metaphor. And without going through the entire article or every move of, of this really important uh, contribution, I would love to ask you a little bit about this because it's one of these, these terms, uh, phrases in the Yoga Sutra uh, that comes really at the end of the text in the, in the fourth pada. Um, really, and at the very end, where we, after we've already gone through all of these different levels of, of samadhi, of cognitive samadhi with an object, sampragnata samadhi, asampragnata samadhi, and even various stages in between, all of a sudden, and, and almost out of nowhere, Patanjali seems to introduce this new term and which seems to be this really, really exalted high state of meditative absorption, uh, which, which he terms, or, 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 or the term he uses, is Dharma Mega. And as, as you know, and as your article lays out, there's been a real history of interpretation of this term, which can translate, I mean, literally as, as, as the cloud or, or the rain cloud of Dharma. And so there's been a lot of different interpretations of, you know, what does the word dharma mean here? What is the rain cloud of dharma? What type of samadhi is this? I think there's differing opinions, both within the Sanskrit commentarial tradition, and then also among more modern scholars and translators who have tried to make sense of this. And I think what again you do so well is helping us to look at locate a word a really technical term like this by looking also at the broader buddhist context so and especially you know with a term like dharma which holds and carries so much weight in these buddhist contexts as well so somewhat briefly you know without going into again every single step of, of the way of this article but what, what can you tell us about what you've found about this term Dharma Mega Samadhi and, and, and how do you think Patanjali is using it uh, here in the sutras uh, for anybody who wants to look it up? This is in 4.29. So I think uh, Dharma Mega is another of those very technical terms in the same way that we've been discussing um, Klesha as part of this technical vocabulary uh, of terms like the bija, the, the scorched seed. So the Dharma Mega, the cloud of Dharma, um, is also discussed in the commentary um, to Sutra 1.2, if you read the Sutra and the commentary, the Bhashya together as a whole. Um, so arguably, it's not just introduced um, at the very end, if we read uh, the Patanjali Yoga Shastra as, as a unitary composition, but it's also used to frame uh, the path of practice from, or the path of practice and philosophy, I should say, from the very beginning of the text. Um, and in many ways, I had the same question, um, which uh, led me on an intertextual journey. What is the term Dharma Mega? If it's so important, why do we seem to have um, so little explanation of its um, its function, its significance in Patanjali's text. Um, and again, I went back to um, the Vedic uh, text, to the Upanishads, um, to the Mahabharata, to the Gita, um, but it was really in the early Mahayana Sutras um, that I found um, Dharma Mega um, elaborated um, as a, uh, a soteriological um, concept or the, the, the zenith of a system of, of liberation. Um, and there it has this very um, uh, common meaning or, or, or frequently recurring um, meaning of uh, referring to this uh, rain cloud um, which pours down um, abundant waters onto the earth and and um, brings about uh, cultivation of the good. So mm. we've been talking about Klesha as elimination of the negative um, and the Dharma Mega is in a way um, a conceptual counterpart to that. Um, it's the um, abundant sharing of the teachings 
um, from the Buddha or the Bodhisattva, depending on which um, uh, tradition of Buddhism we're, we're reading. Um, because the term is there also um, in a more nascent form in the canonical Buddhist scripture, but most definitely elaborated distinctly in early Mahayana. And those uh, descriptions in the Mahayana sutras are really evocative. They're very, um, very much um, imbued with this notion of uh, fecundity and fertility, and um, they're often very detailed in the, in the way that we find in those uh, Mahayana sutras. And I was struck by the, um, the distinctness and the difference of Patanjali's use of the term Dharma Mega in relation to these Buddhist sources, mm. um, where it is a very, it's used very min minimally, very sparingly, as we would expect really of any metaphor in the, in the sutra style. Right. Sutras tend not to um, elaborate in the same way um, as the Buddhist uh, Mahayana sutras do. But even conceptually, um, because Dharma Mega in the Sankhya system is referring to a state of isolation, whereby the goal is for Purusha, the principle of pure consciousness, um, to be realized as distinct, as separate from Prakriti, the principle of pure materiality. Um, my understanding of Dharma Mega. Uh, in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra is that it does indicate something quite opposite to the Buddhist meaning of fullness and abundance. It indicates this technical notion of, of lack, of isolation, um, which is the ideal state of liberation in the Yoga Sutra and its Bhashya. So then the question becomes, well, if we accept that it's different, perhaps even seems to have some kind of opposite meaning, to that of the much more um, prevalent Buddhist use, then why is it different? Is it that um, Patanjali is co-opting this term from the Buddhist religious sphere and imbuing it with a distinct Sankhya meaning? Um, is this in a way um, the kind of um, polemical encounter that we see in debate where terms are taken and revised? Um, so, so that was the question that I was exploring in that article, coming to the conclusion that um, because we see Dharma Mega in the um, Lotus Sutra, in the Dashabhumika Sutra, in the Sandhya Sutra, in all of these um, different Buddhist texts, my assumption is that the prevalent um, meaning of it was being determined and discussed by the Buddhists and that Patanjali is in some sense responding to that or co-opting the term um, for the Sankhya system, for his text. Yeah, that is quite interesting then. If, if, if it clearly in the Buddhist context means this sort of rain cloud of the Buddha Dharma, of the teachings uh, of the Buddha, that sort of rain down and again, in kind of an agricultural metaphor, the, these teachings that the coolness of the rain of the, of the Dharma that sort of rains down and nourishes uh, and, and eliminates the, the obstacles or, or the suffering of the, um, of, the, of the bodhisattvas, of the practitioner. You have that kind of an imagery and if that's invoked by this term, it really does all of a sudden seem out of place in the Yoga Sutra where I don't think Patanjali would say, okay, now you're at this very end, you've, you've renounced, you're no longer interested in this thing called prasankhyana, which we won't get too into right now, but this really high state of, of concentration or meditative absorption. And then through one's discriminative discernment or viveka kyati, then this samadhi called Dharma Mega arises. I don't think he's saying then the, the Buddhist teachings then rain down. <laughs> no. That would be, that would be no. very odd. So, yeah, perhaps no. he, um, he's borrowing, but then uh, re, re reframing the term. But it is really curious, even in the Bhashya, it doesn't really explain what that means. It does say, though, then, of course, the next sutra, Tataha Klesha 
karma nivrittihi, then we have this total cessation of the kleshas and the karmas. So it is obviously this really important liberative moment where because of this dharma meka samadhi, there then is the cessation of, of the kleshas. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's always puzzled me as just this sort of interesting problem. And so what is, what is sort of your, your main takeaway of, of having kind of looked at this broadly? It, if, if this is a Brahminical reuse or readaptation of it, what do we think that potentially means by it? I think it means exactly as you've um, so eloquently put, it just means cessation. It means um, the state of cessation that arises when we apply discriminating discernment correctly. Um, and the state of cessation is what produces the isolation of consciousness from materiality. And this is liberation. So I think it's very clear that the Dharma Nega here is, is most definitely not being used to indicate the Buddhist Dharma, mm. but simply um, has the symbolic value of the Dharma Nega in um, Buddhist liberation, which means it's, um, it's the apex of attainment. Mm. Um, so it's, it's just taking the highest uh, value from those... Um, uh, contemporaneous um, Mahayana systems and, and perhaps saying, well, we have our Dharma Mega here in this mm. corner. Um, and this is what it is. It's isolation of consciousness from materiality. So I think what if Patanjali is in some sense co-opting the term, technically, he is divesting it of that Buddhist um, meaning um, and assigning it with a different meaning or a different value in terms of what it means as the liberated state. Right. And of course, the Buddhists don't have ownership over the term dharma. Of course, it has a, a rich legacy and history in the Brahminical tradition, and it carries carries different meaning. Um, so yeah, that, that's a really interesting example of why reading across these texts and traditions is, is so important to be able to locate a broader textual field and context for a history of a really technical and precise term like that. Um, so just to kind of move things forward a little bit, Karen, as I think we're starting to wind down a little bit, um, another thing I really want to talk to you about uh, that moves us beyond uh, this particular conversation is one of the projects that you've been also working on is co-editing this new volume, The Rutledge Handbook of Yoga and Meditation Studies. And I think there's something like over 30 chapters in this new book. I remember seeing a snapshot of a table of, contact, co table of contents, and it, it looks like a really important uh, contribution to perhaps nudge the field forward. I know you're co-editing this volume with Suzanne Newcomb. Can you tell us a little bit about this exciting new edited volume um, and when, when this uh, book will be coming out? Yes, well, the uh, Routledge um, Handbook of Yoga and Meditation Studies is scheduled to be out at the end of October 2020. Mm. Um, it's designed um, as first and foremost, a graduate student handbook, but is also accessible for undergraduates um, and indeed for um, any uh, interested student of uh, yoga and meditation studies. Um, and it is um, 34 chapters, which um, seek to bring together scholarship on yoga and meditation, um, academic uh, yoga studies and meditation studies and to also um, bring the reader up to date on some of the emerging areas of scholarship, some of the new approaches, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, some of the new um, scholarship on different regions, uh, which is being published in English for the first time. Mm. Um, so for example, we have um, 
uh, a key summary on the history of um, yoga in Latin America by Adrian Munoz. Mm. Um, we have um, uh, Hidehiko Kurita has um, authored a chapter on the political history of meditation, yoga and meditation in Japan. Um, we have an overview of the recent history of yoga and meditation in Korea, for example. Um, so these are, you know, some of the chapters that bring um, new regional summaries um, published in English for the first time. We have um, new uh, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary studies such as um, Finney and Geraghty's uh, chapter. I know you had Finn on the podcast recently, so he's... Oh. Um, utilizing sound studies um, in his investigation of the history of Aum um, within um, the practice of yoga. Or um, we have, for example, Gudrun Buneman, who's looking at um, uh, meditation within an art history context and a material culture context. Mm. Um, so it's a really exciting um, scholarly resource um, that I think provides very accessible roundups of where research is um, and also some very um, new particular additions and emerging foci within the combined fields of yoga and meditation studies. That's fantastic. Well, I'm, I'm really excited uh, to, to, to read it. Uh, it really is uh, an impressive volume when we look uh, across um, the various fields and disciplines that are represented in it. And then as you, as you were saying, these different geographies and regions as well that have often been underrepresented uh, until now. So I think it's an exciting contribution to the growing field of yoga studies and sounds like it's gonna help move us forward in a lot of exciting new directions. So- I hope uh, so. Um, and, and in terms of, I think you introduced the book with this phrase reframing the field um, or perhaps I use that phrase um, but the first part does contain some very interesting um, theoretical reflections on what's happening within the field so we have for example um, a chapter by Shamim Black which looks at decolonizing yoga um, we have a chapter by Andrea Jane on neoliberal yoga um, Mark Singleton and, and Borean Larios have co-authored a chapter looking at the scholar practitioner identity mm. within um, the Western Academy. Um, and the, uh, you know, it's 34 chapters, so um, I really have to um, yeah. stop myself now or I would be um, here for a long time, but well, it is I, a scholarly resource. So um, initially it may be um, priced primarily for libraries, but our hope is that um, there will be, um, you know, a more affordable version coming out in the future. Mm, that would be great. Well, I think you've also given me a list of 34 new podcast episodes and scholars to interview as well. So I uh, hope so. That would be great. Yeah, that would be that would keep me keep me occupied and busy for for quite a while. Um, before I let you go, I do have to to ask you about your upcoming course for yogic studies on classical yoga and Buddhism. This course, uh, which is going to run. Uh, July 13th through August 7th. So I guess depending on when folks are listening to this, um, might be very soon. Uh, and uh, enrollment will be opening for this very soon. And um, tell us just, just a little bit uh, about what students uh, can expect in this four-week online course. Well, first, thank you very much for inviting me to teach. I'm very excited about this um, course, which is going to be four classes, uh, looking at this relationship between classical yoga and Buddhism and um, breaking down some of the ideas that I've been talking about today and examining in my recent research. Uh, so the first session will um, take us through um, with close reading of the, um, the, the words, the terms, the paradigms, the frameworks, the practices, which have been identified as quote unquote Buddhist um, by scholars from different time periods. 
Um, and I use those quotation marks because as, as you have rightly pointed out, we have to be careful of making the claim that any particular word is, is Buddhist or Hindu or Jain, for example. But um, there are certainly um, practice, practices and discourses that we can identify as belonging to certain traditions. Um, then in the second and third sessions, we're going to um, break down in a very accessible way um, what we mean by Yogachara, who were the Yogacharas, what did they practice, um, how were they viewed, and we're going to look again with um, slow detailed readings at some of the passages uh, that I've alluded to today which discuss yoga in these different Yogacara texts in the Mahayana Sutras. Mm. And we'll do the same for session three with Patanjali Yoga and Abhidharma. We'll think about some of those um, key ideas about meditation and the mind that we find in Abhidharma and examine passages that um, reflect or share these ideas in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra. And then in the fourth session, we will look at the Yoga Charabhumi Shastra as our potential um, other Shastra of the classical era. And um, we will think about some of the echoes that are apparent in the, the modes of practice um, between the Yoga Charabhumi Shastra and Patanjali's text. Fantastic. Well, I'm excited. I can't wait to take the course myself. Um, I, I know that I will learn a lot. Um, you know, I, I remember actually uh, my second term of, of studying Sanskrit, we read a little bit of the Abhidharma Kosha uh, Karika with uh, Professor Collett Cox from the University of Washington. It was definitely way in way over my head, with only it being my second term of Sanskrit. Um, but I, it's always a text I wanted to return to later because I already saw its importance and parallels for all of these reasons we've been talking about today. So I'm, I'm just personally excited to, to have an opportunity to, to dive into this comparative textual study a bit further with you and excited to uh, share that um, with the, the broader uh, community and anybody who's interested in exploring these topics. And um, kind of carving out the time to actually get to sit down and, and really closely read these texts and these passages side by side and to think across, you know, Hindu and Buddhist uh, yoga traditions. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Karen, you know, for, for offering the course and for your time today, uh, for sharing with us your, your fascinating and important, important research on all of these topics. And um, yeah, just a big thanks. Thank you very much for having me. And I've really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, you bet. Uh, uh, of course, we'll be in touch soon about the course. And uh, I, I think uh, that's all for now. So take care, Karen. I hope it uh, cools down for you there in London. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs>